In the early 1910s, the Barcelona-based hispano Suiza company began to produce a range of sports cars powered by a new lightweight V8 engine. When the First World War began in July 1914, the company's management decided to shift their focus to war material. Their first project was to adapt their V8 for use in aircraft. What emerged from their workshops in February 1915 would prove to be the most successful aircraft engine used by the Entente powers during the war. The 11.76-litre hispano Suiza 8A was both powerful at 150 horsepower and relatively light, weighing 202 kilograms or 445 pounds dry. It was around 40% lighter than a radial engine of equivalent power. Crucially, it was also more reliable than any of the other engines available to the French at this point in the conflict. The burning question was how to best use this potentially game-changing motor in an aircraft. The task of designing said aircraft fell to Louis Bechereau. He was a comparative veteran of three previous attempts to design a single-seat fighter and based the new aircraft on his previous Type A. The aircraft's origin was most obvious in the design of the wings. Bechereau favoured a single-bay design augmented by light vertical struts in the mid-bay that braced the wires and reduced vibration. The SPAD-7 thus looks like a two-bay, but it's actually a single. The streamlined wing struts were made of aluminium. Ailerons on the upper wing surfaces were actuated via a system of shafts and cranks unique to SPADs. Bechereau's fuselage design had lovely clean lines. It was of conventional fabric over wood construction, although the fuselage forward of the cockpit was covered with steel sheets. It made a virtue of the substantial engine bearers needed for the Hispano Suiza by using them as very strong longitudinal structural components. Fuel was carried in an under-fuselage tank that was shaped to fit the contours of the fuselage. Fuel was transferred to a service tank on the upper wing by an engine-driven pump. A single Vickers 303 was mounted above the engine, slightly offset to starboard to place it in a natural position for aiming with the right eye. The gun was connected to an interrupter gear driven off the rear end of the starboard camshaft. All up, the aircraft weighed 1,102 pounds empty and 1,554 at maximum weight. The prototype flew for the first time in April 1916. SPAD's own assessment was that it could make 133 miles an hour. A more sober analysis, conducted a few days later by the Royal Flying Corps, suggested a more believable 105.4 at 10,000 feet and 122 miles an hour at ground level. The climb to 10,000 feet took just nine minutes, which was very good for the time. Its best characteristic was, however, its diving ability. In testing, pilots routinely dived it to 250 miles an hour with no issues. Pilots did, however, much prefer the Newport 17 as a dogfighter as it was lighter and both turned faster and more immediately. But so impressive was its performance as a hit-and-run fighter versus the Newport that 268 examples of the SPAD were immediately ordered. Having hitherto been known as the SPAD-5, it was ushered into service as the SPAD-7 for reasons that are lost to history. As a backup in case of failures in the Hispano engine, a version was developed with 150 horsepower Renault 8G, but this never saw service. The production aircraft was a little larger than the prototype, gaining about 6 inches in wingspan to 25 feet and 8 inches across the top plane and 24 feet 10 across the bottom. The fuselage was 20 feet and 6 inches long. Unfortunately, deliveries to squadrons were slow because of the issues sourcing raw materials to make the radiators. Only half of the requested 50 aircraft were delivered by September 1916, and only 143 rather than the intended 280 in the last quarter of the year. The radiator production issues bit hard in the cold winter of 1916. Pilots struggled to keep the engine warm enough to run smoothly in the frigid air. A variety of cowling modifications and radiator shutters were tried, culminating in butterfly valves being installed in the radiator pipes to reduce the flow of coolant in the engine block. Eventually, a system of nine vertical shutters over the radiator became standard. Radiators were an ongoing problem because SPAD had not alighted on a single standard fitment for the type in the winter of 1916-17. They claimed to the military that any one of a number of aircraft radiators could be used interchangeably, which might well have been true, 
Unfortunately, the cowlings were not interchangeable and the various installations caused vibration and leakage problems that persisted until SPAD eventually decided to offer one 12-sided tube radiator and one octagonal film type. The contrast with mass production that took place in the Second World War is quite stark. These were still essentially artisan industries that scaled up to a remarkable degree but remained idiosyncratic. Vibrations caused by the powerful engine also led to strengthening measures being taken, starting with simplification of some of the fuselage joins in November 1916, and then replacement of some aluminium bracing components with steel in 1917. More extensive use of steel was insisted on by the RFC when they ordered the type at the height of the Fokker menace. And, to cap it all, the innovative interrupter gear proved hard to perfect, leading to even more delays. What the design also really needed by the spring of 1917 was more power. This was duly supplied via an uprated Hispano Suiza 8AB engine that first gave 180 horsepower by way of higher compression ratio and strengthened internals that allowed it to run at up to 1800 RPM rather than 1500 in the 150 horsepower model. These faster models arrived in April 1917 and they were immediately effective. They joined survivors of the 268 original SPAD 7s delivered by the end of February. Of these, 39 examples had gone to the RFC rather than French military aviation. Similarly to their French allies, the RFC liked the SPAD's diving performance and regarded it as a sufficiently manoeuvrable aircraft in the hands of an experienced pilot. Visibility was better than the Sopwith Pup, but not as good as the Newport. This was despite the RFC replacing the streamlined windscreen with a fairing to protect the gun breach on British-built aircraft. Pilots hated this and they removed it in the field. The RFC tried fitting a Lewis gun to the aircraft's top wing to increase firepower, but it had a significant impact on performance and the idea was shelved. They did, however, modify the ammunition feed to the machine gun to improve reliability, but generally regarded the SPAD's firepower to be inadequate. In total, the British would build 220 aircraft under licence and purchase an additional 185 from France. Mass availability of superior British types meant that the SPADs left the Western Front in November 1917. They did, however, do good service in Palestine until the end of the war. The French military had hoped to receive 800 SPADs by the spring of 1917, but production lagged well behind. Poor performance of the Newport 28, which was supposed to be operated alongside the SPAD 7 as a pier, meant that the shortfall was felt very severely by French pilots. Even so, what aircraft they did get helped them reach parity with the German fighters over the battlefield for the first time in a year. One of their leading aces, Georges Guinemer, reported to Bechereau that the new fighter loops wonderfully. Her spin is a bit lazy and irregular, but deliciously soft. Yes. Despite that love letter, in the first year after its introduction, barely a thousand examples would enter service. Eventually, eight other manufacturers would build the SPAD 7 in an attempt to get it into mass production. Even then, only 3,500 examples would be completed by the armistice. As I said, the SPAD's principal weakness was the lack of firepower. It had a single Vickers at a time when most German fighters had a pair of machine guns. Some aces were dismissive of this disadvantage but in reality it was a problem, and one remedied on the nearly 7,000 powerful twin-gun SPAD 13s that were ultimately produced as the 7's successor. But this type was also beset with reliability troubles, and it would have likely benefited from a later introduction. Trying to mass-produce it too early restricted the resources needed to get the SPAD 7 to the front in large numbers. That said, 3,500 aircraft was double the production of the contemporary Sopwith Pup, although far short of the Camel which was first deployed in the early summer of 1917. Five and a half thousand of those would be made. Around a hundred SPADs were also built in Imperial Russia at the Ducks factory near Moscow before the revolution, and a smaller number, sources are unclear how many, were supplied from France. Initially, the Russian-built planes had 150 horsepower engines installed, but later those were switched for the more powerful 180 horsepower unit. The fast and durable SPAD was arguably the best aircraft available to the Russian army over the Eastern Front in 1916 and 1917, and it was well liked by its pilots. But during the first year of its service as a part of the Air Force of Imperial Russia, pilots faced a problem with takeoff and landing on snow. 
aircraft on the standard wheeled chassis stuck in the snow, leading to disaster. The obvious solution was a temporary conversion from wheels to skis, which was done several times in various places. This modification was repeated by the Finns, who apparently acquired one aircraft and flew it against the Bolsheviks. At least one aircraft, like this one, was captured by the Germans as the Russian army collapsed in November 1917, but what they thought of it wasn't recorded. Remaining aircraft were taken into service by the new Workers' and Peasants' Air Fleet, a precursor to the Soviet Air Force, and flown against the White Russians, and then later against Polish Spad 7s during the Soviet-Polish War of 1921. Despite having reached comparative obsolescence in the accelerated natural selection that took place over the Western Front, the 7 was one of the most numerous French fighters when the German offensive of March 1918 began. It also served with Belgium, Italy and the US when they joined the war in 1917. 189 aircraft were supplied to the new US Army Air Force starting in December 1917, but the order was only completed by October 1918. Production issues once again. It was a sufficiently good aircraft that surplus French examples were exported all over the world, serving into the early 1930s. But by this time it was totally obsolete, and a new threat was looming. 